Welcome to CommercialDrones.fm, the podcast that explores the commercial drone industry, the people who power it, and the concepts that drive it. I'm your host, Ian Smith. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Commercial Drones FM. Ian Smith here, and I am sitting in Chicago, Illinois, with Drew Bostian. He is the business development manager at Mike Ascents. Welcome to the show, Drew. Yeah, thanks, Ian. It's exciting. Thank you for being here. Always a pleasure to have somebody new on the show. And Mike Ascents is a really cool company I've been following for quite some time. But before we get into what you do at Mike Ascents and the technology that you guys produce, Tell us a little bit about your background. I understand that you drove here to Chicago, Illinois. Um, so yeah, maybe you can start with where you're from, yeah, what right. city you're from. I live currently in Davenport, Iowa, and that's where I grew up too. So my family farms just outside of the Quad Cities. If you're not familiar with the geography of Iowa, there's the Mississippi River and then the Quad Cities is right there. So we farm maybe like five or six miles outside of the, the Mississippi River. What kind of crops? Corn and soybeans. Corn and soy, okay. Yeah, yeah. and we, we also go. raised hogs until I went off to college, and then my dad decided he didn't want to do it on his own anymore. <laughs> he needed the help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, oddly enough, there was a, a really good high school rowing program in the Quad Cities, and uh, I also was into agriculture, and I ended up going to Cornell for undergrad because I was recruited to row, but they also had a good ag program. So I went to Cornell for four years, and then after Cornell, I worked at uh, at Pioneer Hybrid at a plant research station in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. That was a lot of just like gathering phenotyping data. Basically, all day long, I would walk around in a cornfield with a computer and take plot scores. It's like super boring. Um, I really didn't like it. And so after my internship of six months was up, I changed jobs. I went to um, work at a precision ag dealer in DeWitt, Iowa, installing um, ag leader um, mm. aftermarket precision ag equipment on like combines, planters, tractors, sprayers, that sort of thing. Um, I was there for about a year and then I came on at the Climate Corporation in about 2011. And um, I was a sales manager there for about just under three years. So it was kind of fun to like get into the startup environment. And then I actually got to see the acquisition by Monsanto happen in mm-hmm. 2013 and just like see the company transform, you know, from startup to kind of a, a subsidiary of a larger company. So that was kind of interesting for me. And it was like a seeing the startup scene, I hadn't really like known it existed. And so that was like, it was just fun being part of like a, an energized team like that, trying to bring something new to the market. Yeah. Um, but I actually, after Climate Corp, I took some time off from the ag industry and I went to coach rowing at uh, University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Nice. So I did, uh, I coached collegiate rowing for two years and then uh, I decided I didn't want to be a, a coach for the rest of my life. And I wanted to get back into the, the ag tech space. Mm. And I knew that that drones and remote sensing and agriculture was kind of a hot thing. And uh, I actually just started following ag funder newsletter like on a day on a weekly basis and like seeing who got a new round of funding because I knew they were yeah. going to use that funding money to exactly. hire people. <laughs> yeah, so, good strategy. Yeah, so I saw that uh that Mike Ascents uh, got a round of funding from Parrot and I emailed them, I sent them my resume and just basically said, "Hey, I'd love to like help grow this company and here's my background in ag tech and uh, I was fortunate enough to come on in 2016. Nice. Yeah, yeah, about the same time I started the podcast, you were saying. Uh, so we've been doing this in a similar amount of time. And I've heard of Mike Ascents for a long time in the drone industry. They've been around um, since what? When was Mike Ascents founded? Do you know uh, it was 2014. 14, okay. Yeah. When you talk about precision agriculture and drones, or just literally drones and agriculture or remote sensing and drones, I mean, there's all this talk about multi-spectral and different spectrums of light and capturing that data and using different sensors. And MicaSense has always produced very special sensors that accomplish this in a very calibrated, like highly scientific way, which is incredibly important. My time at Drone Deploy and working with a lot of growers and farmers through that helped me realize that very immensely, which is a lot of fun times. And so 
Can you tell us a little bit then, I mean, that was like a tiny little overview, but like, what does Microsense make? Like, what kind of products are these? And by the way, side, <laughs> total segue before I forget, I just started rowing like in the bay in San Francisco, <laughs> literally uh, like last week I joined a club. So I'm going to ask you for some rowing tips. Yeah. So you're going to be my uh, interim coach after this, but <laughs> back to the show. <laughs> tell us about Microsense. like what products, I mean, it's not just hardware sensors. We want to hear about that, but it's also software, but just give us like the, the overview here of what you guys do over at Microsense. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think when uh, the founders started the company, they actually had a plan, at least this is the way that I heard the story. So they actually had a plan to build a drone that was for the agricultural industry. And so they were they were designing, you know, this drone. And then when it came time to add a multispectral payload to the drone, they really couldn't find what they were looking for anywhere. And so they identified a hole in the market for these multispectral cameras and they kind of dropped the drone idea and they started building a camera specifically for drones, a multispectral camera specifically for drones. So what Micasense develops, designs and manufactures is drone-based multispectral cameras. So they're lightweight, they're low power draw, professional grade multispectral cameras that are, are good for capturing highly accurate multispectral data from a drone. So mm-hmm. for, I guess, for the people who don't know a lot about multispectral imaging, what we're doing is we're, we're looking at what a plant looks like at specific points along the plant's reflectance profile. So I guess the easiest way to explain this via audio is to think about, <laughs> yeah, tough. is, is to think about um, like when you go out in the summertime, as long as you're not in a desert, like you're, the plants are going to look green. So the trees are going to look green. As you get into the fall, the trees start to change color. So they go from green to yellow to red to brown. So what's happening is a plant, when it's green, is absorbing a lot of red light and blue light for photosynthesis to grow. And it's not absorbing a lot of green. So in the visual portion of the spectrum, we're seeing a lot of green light but we're not seeing the other colors because they're getting used by the plants. So when the plant starts to die and it stops going through photosynthesis as as effectively, um, it starts to show those other colors that aren't being used as much. So like red starts to become apparent when it wasn't apparent earlier in the season. So that's a really obvious thing that we can see with our eyes visually. But what we're looking for is very subtle changes that are occurring throughout the growing season for a, a farmer or that are occurring throughout the, mm-hmm. a research season for someone in research. And we're picking up very small changes in reflectance at different points along the profile, and we can use that data to better understand the physiological changes that are occurring in a, a canopy. So that was a lot, but... No, no, that's a <laughs> very good explanation. I really appreciate that. I've tried to explain this to people. I don't have nearly like remotely credentials like you do to even talk about that intelligently, but I saw it firsthand. And what, one thing I want you to kind of touch on too is... In the past, and I think it probably still happens now, is there are companies out there that sell, like sometimes they call them NDVI sensors, which is actually Mm -hmm. not even close because NDVI is an actual, it's an algorithm. Um, So it's not a, it's not a type of sensor or anything. Um, You can, anyways, well, let's table the rant (laughs) on that. But one thing I wanted to touch on was the importance of just calibrated data. So There are, and there used to be, or whatever, you'll probably, you know this more than I do, but there's people who sell uh, modified cameras, basically. Cameras that are meant to be normal RGB, like cameras like on your cell phone, that they remove some filters or add some filters on that like supposedly will give you a similar image than what a, maybe a true like multi-spectral camera, like a Micasense camera can give you. And because there's no calibration going on, maybe you can just touch on the calibration and what's the difference between like a true purpose-built sensor from the ground up that you guys create versus like some modified camera that's going to cost obviously a lot less, but the data mm-hmm. you're going to get is probably not going to be reliable. Yeah, yeah. And that's, I think that's how Micasense has become so successful over the years is we've just sort of stuck to the scientific basics of capturing very narrow, they're called discrete spectral bands, Um, So we're looking at spectral bands that are between 10 and 40 nanometers. So when I talked about blue, green, red, red edge, and near infrared, the camera's capturing those five bands, um, and it's not capturing any other data. Like, it's very specific. You know, we can continue to focus on the red. So we're capturing 10 nanometers worth of reflectance data at red. And what that does is if there's a slight change in reflectance 
at that very low point in the red trough, we're going to pick it up with that. But if you were to use a, a converted camera, like what you're describing, where you just take a camera off the shelf and you put a, a filter in there to try to get a pseudo red and a pseudo near infrared to create NDVI, that spectral band is going to be very wide. It's going to be very rough. You're not going to get just red. You're going to get other data along the spectrum that's mm-hmm. going to make that reflectance data messy. So basically, I guess to sum it up, you're not going to see subtle changes. You're going to see big changes occurring. So yeah. if you want to see how the crop has been damaged like after the fact, you could probably do that with a converted camera. If mm-hmm. you want to see early stages of change, of damage, um, and to like early enough to actually do something about it, you want narrow spectral bands. I mean, this is just like, it's like what doctors tell us. Like you practice prevention, you know, like when you see something happening, like sometimes it's too late, you can't do anything. Um, so yeah. It's similar. I mean, they're living things. You want to be able to to tell like, oh, are they sick? Or are they about to be sick? Is this like a historical sign that maybe I need to do some like application on on the crops or like take some evasive action? So that's really interesting. I always had, I, I never thought how much I'd learn about agriculture. There's always something else to learn. And it's always been like really cool to kind of pick that up. And who was the founder? Gabriel? Yeah, Gabriel Torres. Yeah. So I saw a talk by him years ago Mm -hmm. and it was kind of hilarious because there was, he was on a panel. (laughs) There was someone touting the benefits of modified sensors, like what we were just talking about. And then he came on and he was like, it was just like, I don't know. It was like so funny because I knew this was coming and he wasn't going to like, yeah. it was literally like the opposite ends of the spectrum going at each other. Um, There's an engineer that was going to like set it straight. Basically, yeah, right? exactly. So he came on, he was like, look, I don't know about what that person just said, but you actually need this data or this type of sensor to get it. And it's super convincing when you see it. And for the record, there are algorithms, vegetation indices that are actually made for like RGB normal cameras. Like one of them is called VARI, V-A-R-I. Um, you can get it. You just literally process the image in a specific way. And it's made by NASA. It's like open source, public, whatever. And you can see visual differences with an RGB camera a little bit better than you could without the algorithm applied to it. Sure. So those are never going to replace properly calibrated, like super specific data for looking at crops like intently. So yeah. Yeah, and I'm sure your software, like the next thing I wanted to kind of get into is like, so, okay, you sell this sensor, but you guys also have software that goes with it, right? And what is your sensor called, actually? Because I just uh, yeah, saw so, a new one. So Red Edge MX is the fifth rendition of Red Edge. So we had Red Edge 1, Red Edge 2, Red Edge 3, Red Edge M, and now Red Edge MX. So Red Edge MX, it comes with a new DLS2, which is a downwelling light sensor that's uh, radiometrically calibrating the data. Um, so that's a whole other thing we could get into. But the other sensor that we just released in November is the Altum. So it's Altum, got yeah. higher resolution imagers, um, and it also has a thermal imager in there from FLIR. So we were getting a lot of a lot of requests from academics saying that they needed they wanted assistance in aligning thermal with multispectral, and so that's kind of what led to developing Altum. So basically, what they were doing was using a thermal sensor one time, basically in a separate camera. And then with a multispectral and then trying to figure out how to place those images right. on top of each exactly. other effectively. And so you guys just integrated it. Like, hey, yeah. we'll just stick the FLIR sensor inside of our own housing and then add our own special sauce onto it. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Okay. That's cool. So that's more targeted than at the academic kind of folks yeah. that really need that thermal data. Yeah. Or? And so I guess um, something I meant to mention earlier is um, what's kind of interesting to see is Academic and commercial research has been a huge part of our customer base over the last few years. And um, and I think we've always stayed true to high data quality um, in terms of the narrow bands and the radiometric calibration. And we've never wavered from that. And I think it's paid off because I think we've won over most of the academic community and it's starting to kind of bleed into production agriculture. So we're starting to see partnerships with software companies that are specifically targeting agriculture, um, like production agriculture, not just research. Um, Like, for example, Aerobotics is a company based out of South Africa who builds analytics for tree crops. Um, And they've realized the importance of the high quality of our data. And they're basically exclusively using the Red Edge. So to address your question about our software, so we had been developing a software called Atlas. I think we had started that in 2015, and we sort of abandoned it in 2017. Oh, okay. It's still there, and you can still use it. 
but we're not really doing much to develop it anymore. Shifted um, focus more just purely to the sensor then. Yeah, so we kind of made a decision. That's our strength. That's you know, how we're recognized. We we felt like we could do a lot more um, development and, and offer a lot more to the industry by just focusing on hardware. So that's kind of what we've done. And we've We've decided to put a lot of energy into these strategic partnerships with uh, software companies that are providing analytics. Okay. And now, a quick word from our sponsors. Genius New York invests millions of dollars in drone and tech startups each year and is looking for its next million-dollar team. The Business Accelerator, located in Syracuse, New York, provides your startup with resources, mentors, and industry-leading connections, plus a chance to compete for $1 million. So if you have a startup focused on unmanned systems, IoT, automation, or data analytics, don't miss this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Apply today at GeniusNY.com. What could your startup do with a million bucks? Go to GeniusNY.com and apply today. Step into the growing season with this very special treat from MicaSense. For this month only, that's July 2019, Buy a MicaSense Altum sensor and get a six-month Agisoft MetaShape license included for free and enjoy high-quality thermal and multispectral imagery with advanced analytics. So the Altum sensor integrates a radiometric thermal camera with five high-resolution narrow bands, producing advanced thermal, multispectral, and high-resolution imagery in just one flight for advanced analytics in agriculture. So during July, get your MicaSense Altum sensor with a free six-month license of Agisoft Metashape by using code AGI2019 at micasense.com. Okay, back to the show. Can you give us an idea of just like the compatibility and the integration with drones? Like obviously like everybody and their mother is flying DJI drones, but mm-hmm. of course there's very popular fixed wing drones out there. Sensefly, Delaire. I mean, do you guys integrate with these uh, platforms, these aerial platforms like pretty deeply into like the, the system level operation? Like how does that work actually from an operator's perspective? Because a lot of these drones, and correct me if I'm wrong, don't come with the MicaSense right. sensor. You have to add it or buy it separately or buy like a package mm-hmm. maybe from a retailer. Right. How do you operate it? How does it kind of talk, make sure everything's good to go in terms of the flight and take the correct images? Because you are doing photogrammetry yep. with these sensors, so you need proper overlap on all the images. Right. Right. And you need to know aircraft metadata like speed and heading and all that stuff. Yeah, so there are a couple different approaches you can take. To use the cameras that we, we make, you could have as simple a solution as, as strapping the camera onto a Phantom 4 and having a battery pack on there to power the camera, and you could capture data that way. The way that you could get away with that is there's actually a Wi-Fi signal that comes out of the camera that you can connect to with your phone or a tablet or a computer and set the camera up for triggering or overlap mode. And so once the camera senses it's moving, it has a GPS receiver, so it's going to capture data accordingly to capture good overlap. So that's kind of like a rudimentary way of capturing data. Mm. But we partner with a lot of UAV companies, like you mentioned, like the EBX from SenseFly just released uh, an integration with the Red Edge MX. And and they're kind of more on the professional side of the integrations where they've utilized the open API of the Red Edge MX and they're actually sending trigger signals to the camera. So you're, okay. you're in their eMotion software, you set up the mission and you don't even interact with the camera. Nice. It's just it just knows what to do. Exactly. I mean, it makes sense because you guys are not just doing DJI stuff because with agriculture, you have huge, hundreds of acres. I mean, you can have thousands of acres. It depends on like the mission type. Yeah. So having a fixed wing aircraft makes a ton of sense a lot of times with, with agriculture. That's really interesting. So do you guys integrate, um, what was that, DJI? The Skyport. Yes. Yeah. Do you guys integrate with that? Yeah. Okay. We released the Skyport in like November, December of 2018. Okay. Cool. So you can buy the basically, it's like a Matrice 200 series mainly. Yeah. So it, it works best on the, the Matrice 200. We're trying to work with DJI a little bit to get the compatibility going on the 210. But okay. right now, 200 is like fully compatible. If you use it on a 210 or even an Inspire 2, it's going to pull power. So it's going to power the drone, but you're still mm. going to go through the web app of the camera to get it set up for capture, like I described before. Okay. Gotcha. And so maybe you can tell us a little bit, like just practical speaking, like let's say Ian's 
farming company. I have like 250 acres of like soybean, corn, what have you. And I've got a drone. I think the technology is cool. I buy the MicaSense sensor. I mean, do you have any stories you can share? What kind of like actual, like realistic Mm -hmm. stuff that me as the farmer, as the grower, like what could I actually do with this? What could like practically happen? And if you have stories like from customers or anything that you have like on firsthand basis where your sensor helped, then please share that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the tricky thing is with commodity crops right now, corn and soybeans, like the market is so bad that... um, you can capture drone-based multispectral data, but capturing actionable, like if the data tells you to do something, it's probably not worth it for you to go do it. Like you're <laughs> okay, so I'm going to do leave. blueberries right, or right, some right. type of specialty crop. Exactly. Then, right. So so with commodity crops, probably like specifically corn or soybeans, um, a few applications I've seen are just identifying tile lines. So the multispectral data, if it's bare ground, it's really easy to see tile lines. Um, Nobody's going to know unless they're <laughs> in agriculture what a tile line is. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. So, to yeah, sure. Uh, Precision Agriculture 101, by the way. <laughs> so typically, um, if someone wants to boost their yield and they're, and they're located in the Midwest, like the I-States, one way to do that is to, is to lay tile so you can better control the moisture content of your soil. So tile is basically going to drain the field more efficiently. So if you don't have tile, you might have standing water. The ground might get a little soggy, and that's going to impact your yield. So what farmers do is they lay these these big plastic tile lines, these like tubes in the ground, maybe like three or four feet down, to help drain the field out. So um, underneath the ground, exactly. and then it's helping with drainage to exactly. regulate the moisture. So, yeah, so the issue is that sometimes, like, I mean, they've been doing this for decades, and uh, the old stuff isn't mapped out. And so they don't know where it's located. And when you put in a new tile line, you have to tie into like the main line of the Mm. old system. And so using the the drone data, sometimes you can identify those main lines to tie into. So you can kind of see like the outline of it maybe from above. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. So like my dad doesn't use drones, but (laughs) he he, uh, occasionally like root systems will of weeds in waterways will just grow into those tile lines and totally mm. clog them. And so, but they don't know where the clog's at. So they spend all day with a backhoe looking for that clog. With drone-based data, you'd be able to see like where the soil is saturated with multispectral data, with thermal data, and maybe better identify that location. But but I guess getting to your point, you know, the reason we have partnered with Aerobotics is because they're targeting crops that are worth a lot of money. Mm. And so it makes sense to capture that data. Um, is it similar to like to vineyards, like for yeah. for wineries? And yeah, stuff? yeah, okay. yeah. Um, the difference of an acre of corn is like right now probably like six or seven hundred dollars in revenue for an acre of corn. If you were to look at an acre of almonds, I actually don't know what it would be, but it'd probably be like ten thousand dollars or something like that. So that's the difference, right? Okay. And so that's why we're starting to see some traction in the high value crop stuff. Well, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, you find the problem in the high value crop, you go and fix it because it means a lot more yep. to your bottom line if you don't. Right. That's crazy. So you can tell disease sometimes. You can tell, like, is there like a compendium, like an atlas of like all this data? Do you need some kind of like, I know that some of the software companies are trying to make this easy, but mm-hmm. do you need some type of agronomist to make heads or tails of this data once you see it? Because I've seen a lot of a yeah. lot of data. And one of the things that actually, like the big insights, and Chad Colby used to tell me this, and I was like, mm-hmm. spout it out. But it's basically like, if you show an agronomist a field that they don't know about the history, like it's like you were just saying, like if you don't know that there was tile previously, yeah. you could be seeing something on one of the images on any kind yeah. of imaging and um, you could mistake it for something else or just be like, well, that could be tile. That could mean something else. It could mean this, could mean that. Am I on the right track there? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's funny. I mean, a lot of times if you were just go back three or four years and you show um, a farm manager a map and they're just like, oh, yeah, I know why that's lower there. Like there's a sandy knob there. It's like, thanks for showing me something that I already know. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Well, it goes the opposite way, though, too, because like you can't just come out without that knowledge sometimes. So it's almost like you have to show it's a really interesting relationship between it's like an intimate relationship with your field, what you know about it, the history of it, the past seasons, the sandy knob or whatever you call it. I mean, like an outsider won't know that kind of stuff. So that part of agriculture is really interesting to me because it's not always like a like you can't just say, oh, you have. Well, maybe sometimes you can kind of completely diagnose. Yeah. Is that possible? 
Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, like take Altum, for example. I mean, one of the case studies you put together with Altum is in a vineyard and you use all the layers basically to fully understand uh, an irrigation leak. So you look at the RGB composite from Altum and you see that there's excessive growth in a few spots. And then you use the thermal layer and you see that there's some cold spots in those excessive growth areas. So you're Basically, using those two points, you're like, okay, these are irrigation leaks. There's irrigation lines that are causing standing water. And then you look at the NDRE layer and you can see how basically like what's the extent of the excessive growth? How long have each one of those leaks been occurring to cause the excessive growth? So you're kind of like, without even touching the field, you have a ton of information about those leaks that you, you use a lot of the different layers from the camera to figure out. It's just great, yeah, that you, you can add all this more information in there, but I guess maybe software is going to be helping to make that easier to interpret or just spread, maybe even just quicker and yeah. using, do you guys foresee, I mean, since you guys are, are working more closely with the software partners, then my question to them would probably just be making it easier and, and kind of using all this data that's been collected and that will be collected, compiling it and just applying some type of machine learning, maybe to spot trends and highlight certain areas that could be at risk. I mean, maybe before a like you or I or anyone or even the farm owner that knows about the sandy knob and, Mm -hmm. you know, (laughs) can actually like uh, see something happening there. But I think that with the granularity of the data from the MicaSense sensors, getting that red edge, getting the special layers that you guys provide, I think that's going to be probably even more key to just get that like more dialed in insight there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we provide the foundation for these other companies to build out meaningful tools. For example, when it comes to to plot analysis on the research side, we have this like tutorial on our on our knowledge base that talks about doing plot level analysis with QGIS, and it's got all this like confusing stuff in there. And then Solvi, one of our software partners, just made the tool, and so you just nice. go in there and you hit like do a plot analysis, and it shows you all the, the average values of every single plot. Instead of going through all of those steps, exactly and right. To learn, so yeah. you don't have to be a, a remote sensing scientist anymore to do plot phenotyping. <laughs> Fascinating. Precision agriculture will always like completely overwhelm me, but also just like <laughs> humble me uh, to the utmost degree. What are some of the future plans then? What, what are you guys moving towards? Anything you can share with us uh, for what's coming next from Micah Sense? Anything you guys are working on or um, just have released uh, along those lines? Yeah, I can't share too much. One thing I can hint at is um, we get a lot of requests for custom bands. So we have the five spectral bands, um, and then we're always getting researchers and you know people doing specific applications saying, can you do this band and this band and this band? And we're toying with some sort of second solution that you, know, you may see in the near future. <laughs> may or may not see. Yeah. Well, awesome. So I'm going to have to buy that farm, uh, that plot of land probably to get like first dibs on it and start planting my seeds. So guys, if you're listening and you're interested in learning more, definitely go to micasense.com uh, in the web browser or Drew's been so gracious to give his email. You can uh, email Drew directly, uh, ask any questions at drew at micasense.com. Very, very easy. Um, so thank you everyone so much for listening. Thank you Drew for being a guest. My last question, are you going to get your dad to use drones? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> He's one of the old school oh, yeah. old school guys. There you yeah. go. All right. Well, thanks Drew again for joining us. Uh, we're going to go ahead and cut off the mics, everyone. Cheers. Cheers.